good evening with over 300 registered tonight for this uh, exciting program. The timing is perfect. Uh, we've taken down our greens uh, from our houses and our house plants have taken a back seat to uh, what we'd like to uh, have pretty in our homes. So um, tonight our presenter is well equipped to provide us with what we need to make uh, our homes uh, have happy, healthy house plants. Candace holds a bachelor's degree in horticulture from the University of Illinois and a master's degree in ag education, also from the U of I. Uh, besides um, the working in extension, she holds a uh, certified floral designer certificate and loves uh, working in her cut flower gardens as uh, so many of us do. So tonight I welcome Candace Hart. Thank you so much. I'm mm -hmm. going to go ahead and share my screen here and get us started. Happy to be here. Like you said, this is definitely a great time of year to be talking about houseplants. I know I'm always adding more to my collection this time of year because I just need that green environment. Okay, so let me get this started. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, I see some uh, questions already come into the chat box. Feel free to add those in as we go and we'll address those at the end, but hopefully a lot of your questions will be answered as we go through today as well. So. Here's what we're talking about today, Houseplants 101, with the ultimate goal of not killing those houseplants, because I know that is a struggle for some, and I've indeed killed my fair share of houseplants, so no one is exempt <laughs> from that status. So we're going to talk about um, selecting houseplants, all of the different um, environmental factors we need to have in order to keep those House plants alive. So, in order for a plant to be successful as a house plant, it needs to be very adaptable in a lot of different areas. It needs to be light adaptable, temperature, humidity, water quality. It needs to be able to survive being in a container, uh, challenges to air circulation. So, what that comes down to essentially is that any plant that's going to be house plant has to be a pretty tough plant in order to survive the conditions inside our home. So, we're going to go through uh, plenty of them today that are the toughest of the tough. Um, so if you've never tried houseplants before, these are going to be some of those that would be great to start with, uh, that you're going to have a good success rate, in, rate with, okay? So usually the most limiting factor for a houseplant success is light, okay? We're bringing these plants indoors where there may not be a lot of light available. You might have plenty of light with your fluorescent bulbs or your, your lighting inside the home, but just because it's enough for us to see and work and use, that doesn't mean it's the right wavelength or the right amount of light for some of these plants to successfully thrive, okay? So we're gonna go through today some low, some medium, and some highlight examples uh, of different plants for different areas inside the home. And if you are having light, um, insufficient light problems, these are one of the things that are gonna show up on your plant. So you might notice there's smaller leaves, especially the newer leaves that emerge, they might be smaller than normal. You might have very long spindly stems that are, appear to be kind of stretching out. That tends to be a light symptom the color might be off. You might have leaves dropping. It may just be weak in general. There's not much growth happening. And if it's a plant that's supposed to flower and it's not flowering, that could also be uh, a sign. So a couple of things to look for. For me, the biggest thing to, to notice is that stretching. Like if a plant is really long and leggy, it's usually a sign that it's trying to stretch to reach uh, better light uh, conditions and generally kind of an off color usually kind of triggers to me too uh, that we might be dealing with a, a light issue. Okay, now if you were to measure that light, if you had a light meter, you could measure the amount of foot candles and see where you fall into those categories. But what we would consider a low light uh, area or a place to put a low light loving plant would be somewhere where there's no direct light at all. So there's not a window. That's going to be difficult, but that's an area. Um, a north facing window is going to be the least amount of sunlight uh, intensity coming in. And then also eight to 12 feet away from any other window or any other light source. Okay, so those would be our light, lo low light conditions. 
Uh, medium light, we're going to consider more of an east or western facing window that's going to have a little more sun intensity throughout the day. And then five to eight feet away from a southern facing window, we would call a medium light area. And then you have your highlight spot, which is essentially going to be in your southern window or close to that southern facing window. That's going to get the most amount of daylight. And those plants that require a lot of light, that's where we're going to put those. Okay. I'm not going to touch too much on indoor uh, supplemental lighting uh, today, but that's certainly an option. If you don't have any of these areas or you're trying to grow a particular plant that you don't have the area for it, um, grow lights can be a way to help you out with that. So you can purchase uh, grow lights that are made just for plants. You can use uh, fluorescent uh, bulbs, which are going to have a similar wavelength for plants. So you can certainly make it work if you don't have that light level um, situation. Okay, so there's always that option of, uh, of lighting. Okay, so light number one, they're important. Number two is going to be water. Okay, if you've ever killed a house plant, more than likely it was probably a watering issue. That's the by far the easiest way to kill a house plant is in most cases overwatering. That's where most people um, struggle. So we'll talk about a couple of tips here uh, when it comes to watering. Okay, one, don't water on a schedule. Okay, if you want to have a schedule um, once a week, you could set a reminder to check your house plants to see if they need watering. Uh, but don't follow a strict schedule to always water on the same day every week. Okay, lighting conditions are going to vary, humidity is going to vary. So you really have to check before watering to make sure that that plant's actually going to uh, need it. So on a schedule is an easy way to, to overwater uh, over time. Okay, when you do water, water wa for most plants, water very thoroughly. So let that water drain through the bottom of the pot and then let the soil typically dry out fully before watering again. Okay, this will vary a little bit on the plant, but for most cases, you're gonna give it a really good deep watering, really saturate it, and then let it dry between. Okay, that's gonna be better for the roots health as opposed to having a soil that's gonna be constantly slightly wet because you just keep adding a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. You're better off doing one really good watering and then letting it fully dry for most house plants are gonna prefer that, okay? And a couple of questions came in ahead of time about bottom watering. You can either water from the top, of course, and pour it in the soil. I'm for the bottom water where you're going to have a tray underneath that pot and you're going to fill the tray with water and let the soil and the roots um, take it up from that way. And that's certainly a way to do it. What I would do is probably fill up that tray and give it about an hour or so for the plant to uptake that water and anything that's left after that amount of time, you're going to dump out of the tray. Okay, the key to bottom watering is that you're not leaving the plant sit in a tray of water for long periods of time. That's where root rots are gonna, uh, are gonna start. Okay, so you can definitely bottom water, just be sure not to leave water in that tray for a really extended period of time, okay? So I mentioned that water thoroughly and then do it less often, give it a really good watering. You might find on the tag sometimes, it'll give you some terminology for watering. Um, if a tag says that a plant is a heavy uh, water, likes a lot of water, that means that that plant you could keep a little bit more on the consistently moist side. We're not talking soggy and dripping wet, just kind of consistently moist. That would be a, a heavy terminology. Medium, you're going to water thoroughly and allow just the surface to dry before you water next. Okay, moderate is going to be water thoroughly and allow the soil to dry. What, like I mentioned, most of our houseplants are going to fall in that category where we want to water them really well and let that soil fully dry before um, watering again. Okay, and then of course you have your light ones that you might give it a little bit of moisture around the roots and then allow it to, to dry. So those are ones that are certainly not going to like a lot of wet soil. For example, succulents, which we'll, we'll talk about. Okay, so just a couple of terms there when it comes to um, to water, but how do you know? So I, I said, don't use a schedule, okay? And I'm gonna stay with that. Um, you can use a schedule to remind yourself to check, but you do wanna check. So 
Some of the easiest ways to tell is to simply touch the soil. So take your finger and touch the surface of the soil, stick it in a couple inches and check for moisture. If it still feels wet, then don't water yet. Okay, like I said, most things you wanna let dry out before you go ahead and water uh, again. Um, once you get familiar with your plant and kind of the soil that's in there, the weight of the container, um, honestly, what I do a lot of times is just lift the pot, kind of tilt the pot up a little and see how much it weighs, okay? And just because I'm familiar with the plant, I can tell over time whether it feels heavy or it feels light, okay? If it feels lighter, that tells me that my soil is pretty dry and I can probably go ahead and um, and add some some water. If it feels heavy still, then that tells me that there's still a good amount of uh, more moisture in there. You use a couple techniques there uh, to really uh, check, okay? You can use moisture meters. They're not reliable. I've uh, found if, if it helps you, if it feels like it gives you a, a more consistent way to do it, feel free. You definitely can. But for me, just touching the soil and checking the weight of the pot is going to be a lot more accurate um, than that moisture meter. Okay, here's some of your symptoms. Okay, remember I said the easiest way to kill a houseplant is water. Uh, and typically that means over water. That's where we're having most of the issues most of the time is that we love our plants so much. We wanna make sure we're giving them a good amount of, of love. That means a lot of times we're giving them more water than they really need. Uh, but unfortunately the symptoms can look similar. If we're talking about too much water, not enough. So you might have wilting for either of those cases. You might have yellowing of the new leaves that are coming out or the tips of the leaves. That would be similar uh, amongst both cases. If you have yellowing on the older leaves, okay, that's typically going to be an underwatering um, symptom. If you have spider mites, that's a pest that we'll talk about spider mites like hot dry conditions so that's typically a sign that there's pretty dry conditions around there and flip side root rot is going to occur in wet soil conditions okay so a couple different symptoms can vary but in general what makes it difficult is that the symptoms of of overwatering and underwatering have some overlap so it gets tricky so that's where really checking that soil, touching it, lifting it up, making sure you're aware of what the soil is like before you're adding more water, okay? So indoors, humidity is gonna be, be a big limiting factor as well. The amount of moisture in the air is the relative humidity. Most of our indoor uh, homes are gonna be uh, less than 20% relative humidity and most plants prefer above kind of a 35% humidity at least. So uh, just keep that in mind is that some plants are going to be more sensitive to that than others. Some of them you might notice you have brown tips starting or the edges of the leaves might show some browning or just kind of drying out. That is probably a, a sign of some low humidity issues. So you can add humidifiers, you can group plants together, uh, which I'll show you, um, but that's a hard one to hard one to overcome indoors because that's just what our heating systems do uh, to the air. And what we're growing are mostly tropical plants. So they're used to growing in humid uh, conditions. So like I mentioned, you might have the leaf edges and tip burn. Um, if we don't have that uh, moisture, you can mist your plants if it makes you feel like you're, you're given a lot of moisture. But when you do that, you're only providing a little bit of humidity for just that period of time that you're spraying. So the minute you stop spraying, that humidity is gonna go back down. So it's not really providing a huge asset, but again, it kind of makes you feel good that you're, <laughs> that you're providing some good care to those house plants. So feel free, just know that it's probably not your best long-term um, solution. If you had to do something, I would, like I mentioned, add an, a humidifier or group your plants together. Okay, just doing that is going to change the environment a little bit. You can also place trays of water below the plants or surrounding the plants that well, that water can evaporate and add some humidity. But again, like I mentioned, don't set the bottom of the pot in the water. So here you can see they have gravel and then the level of the water is below the gravel so that the plant is not actually sitting in um, water. And that's an African violet, which would enjoy that bottom water, but not for a long period of time. Okay, so humidity, very important. 
temperature, not a huge factor. A lot of times for houseplants, usually we our homes are in a, a good zone um, for that. Most plants are going to prefer a 65 to 75 daytime temperature range, and they actually prefer a cooler night. Okay, they actually prefer that temperature difference between um, day and nights. But if they're not getting that, it's not something that's going to um, kill your house plants. What might happen is that you might notice a plant that is supposed to flower may not initiate flowers. So for example, I'll use orchids as an example. A lot of us love orchids. A lot of us struggle reblooming an orchid after we've purchased it and brought it home. Orchids need that night and day temperature range. So the way that I get my orchids to rebloom is I put them outside. So I put them outside for the summer leave them outside until the temperatures start to get down into the 50s and 40s and I bring it in. But when it's outside, it gets that natural shift of day to night temperature. Inside our homes, it just, it does not vary very much unless you're changing your thermo thermostat uh, every day. So giving it that natural day, night temperature fluctuation, that's what's gonna initiate your flowers and get those orchids to uh, rebloom, hopefully, okay? So just a tip there. We're not gonna talk much about orchids because that could be a whole class, but just a tip there. Um, fertilizing, so fertilizing can encourage some, some new growth, some flowering, depending on the type of the plant. You only fertilize during the active growing season though. So this time of year, when the days are short, the temperatures are cool, your house plants are essentially uh, dormant almost. They're not putting on much active growth just because of daylight levels and temperature. So there's no sense to fertilize uh, this time of year in the spring. In summer, you could start to kick back up that uh, fertilizer. You can use whatever type you prefer. Just follow the rate on the package that it recommends. And I will tell you too, is that fertilizing, it's not a, a live or die situation. I will admit I'm a very lazy fertilizer. I almost never remember to fertilizer or take the, <laughs> take the initiative to do it in my house plants do fine. So it's not like it's something that is a, it's a live or die requirement, but it certainly can give you a boost of growth and um, nutrients, especially if your soil is, uh, is older, it's been in that pot for a long period of time, okay? You can't over fertilize though, okay? So if you are uh, having a higher concentration of fertilizer or you're doing it too often, you might notice uh, salt crystals can start to build up either on the side of the pot or on the top of the soil surface. Okay, that's a sign that the salts are building up from that fertilizer and that's, that's too much. So what we need to do is cut back, reduce that fertilizer and good idea to really flush out that uh, pot. So put that pot in the tub and the sink, really water it really well and let that water run out for really a good period of time to kind of flush out that extra fertilizer. And then of course, let it dry really well before you water again. Okay, so you can kind of flush that out, but just watch your, watch your fertilizing, make sure you're not adding too much. Okay, the type of container you pick can be just about anything, okay, any style. Obviously, it's always a good idea to have a drainage hole, okay. You can grow houseplants in a uh, pot that does not have a drainage hole. You just need to be very cognizant of your watering, okay. It's always a safer choice, I feel, to have a drainage hole. That way, if you do overwater, it can, it can come out, okay. You can also leave a pot in its plastic, uh, pot that it came in and then set that inside a decorative pot too. So you can certainly um, double uh, pot essentially, okay? So lots of choices there. The potting mix that you select is gonna be important too. So when you do put that in that container, what we're using is a soilless potting mix. So there's no soil involved, it's peat moss, it's vermiculite, it's a combination of things. And importantly, it's sterile, so there's no diseases, insects we're bringing in. It's a sterile, soilless uh, potting mix. You can use uh, whatever brand you prefer. There's lots of them out there. Just make sure you're getting a good general purpose uh, potting mix for most, uh, most houseplants. Okay. 
A couple of you asked about repotting in the, the questions that you submitted ahead of time. Uh, excellent question. If you do need to repot, the, usually the best time to do that is going to be in the spring when things start getting back into that active growing season. Okay, this time of year, you could certainly repot. Um, but what's going to happen is that there's not going to be a whole lot of new roots put on. It's just going to kind of sit there in that new pot. There's not going to be much growth started. You want to do it when you can really get some new roots going in that new, um, new container. So wait till the spring if you can. And honestly, um, really assess if you even need to repot. Okay, a couple of reasons you might need to is if uh, maybe you've noticed that over time there's really not much growth happening. It's it's not getting any bigger. That could be a fertilizing thing. That could also mean that it's time to repot. Or it also for me, one sign too is if I water have to water more frequently than I used to. The water just kind of runs out really quickly. It doesn't stay wet for a long period of time. That's kind of a sign to me that, okay, it's time to kind of refresh this um, soil a little bit. But if you don't notice any of that, don't repot, okay? Most houseplants are gonna do fine, either pot bound or slightly pot bound. And if anything, it's gonna help you uh, not overwater. Okay, the more roots that are in there, the less uh, possibility you have to overwater. So only repot if you need to, or if you're, let's say you're wanting a different container or something like that, you can. But the key is that to only go up a few sizes. Okay, I'm not going to take a, a tiny little four inch pot and put it in a big 10 inch container because what's going to happen is that you're going to have too much excess soil that soil is going to hold a lot of water for a long period of time and that's a equation for root rot to start so you only want to go up a couple inches in size so that you're not having too much extra potting mix in there that's going to stay wet for a long period of time okay so hopefully that helped with your uh, repotting questions um, when you're out shopping at the garden center, a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, certainly you can shop the clearance, the clearance rack. I do that frequently, uh, but we'll talk about just making sure you uh, inspect things well. Um, price doesn't necessarily always reflect the quality or the uh, anything like that. So always kind of inspect things. And you might bring in some flowering houseplants uh, for you too. So think about things like uh, poinsettias, um, Oh, uh, shoot, I can't even think of anything for the spring. Anything that has kind of a shorter term flower, a, a chrysanthemum as a potted plant, something like that. Uh, just keep in mind that not all of these are easy to reflower. So they may be uh, best used for kind of a short term gift plant that you bring in. You enjoy it while you can, but after that, it's probably best to just kind of toss that, compost it and start fresh the next year, kind of treat it like a cut flower. So a uh, um, poinsettia, for example, you could keep poinsettia as a house plant. Uh, it's gonna be difficult for you to ever get it to color up in the way that it did uh, from the greenhouse. Uh, so for me, uh, purchasing that smaller poinsettia every year is a way for me to support <laughs> the garden center. That's a, a better option for me when it comes to um, flowering plants okay so like i mentioned inspect it well turn it over look on the underside of the leaves see if there's any pest uh, problems that you can see even pull it out of the pot so pull that root ball out of the pot and see how the root system looks you're buying that root system so you want to make sure it's a high quality well developed root system if you pull it out and all the soil just falls to the ground well you know, kind of hide hide that, clean up a little bit. Uh, but that's a sign that there's not a lot of root system in that plant and that probably wasn't one that you wanted to purchase anyways. And on the flip side, if you pull it out and it's just full of roots that are circling, that's probably something that's pretty pot bound, which isn't uh, a no-go, you can make it work. You're just gonna have to certainly repot it uh, when you get home. Okay, so really inspect things well. The easiest way to bring in a new pest problem is to bring it in on a plant, on a new plant. So really inspect things. Okay, and it is normal. You're taking a plant from a high humidity, full sun greenhouse to your low humidity, low light house. Okay, so you're talking about a drastic change for these plants. So don't be too alarmed if it drops some leaves, if it looks a little bit sad, 
for a period of time. Um, a lot of that is just normal change in environment kind of stuff. Okay, so just keep that in mind. And we're not going to go in depth into pests today just because there's not time, but just be aware that there are certainly common houseplant pests like mealybug. Here in the picture is an insect covered with a fuzzy white coating. Um, scale tend to be kind of a um, little round, typically round or oyster shell on along the stems. They will drop a sticky honeydew below where they're feeding. Um, white fly you're going to find on the underside of the leaves, and if you rustle your plant, those will fly fly off. Uh, fungus gnats are going to be a soil dweller. Easiest to control of that is just to let your soil dry down. If you have fungus gnats, you're probably overwatering. So that one's pretty pretty easy. Spider mites, like I mentioned, like hot dry conditions, so we can change the humidity, do some control things there, uh, and then of course there are fungal leaf things as well. So again, not going to go in depth in there. There's a lot. I'll give you some resources at the end. Um, but just to be aware, there are some common problems that can um, can pop up. OK, um, I've got another link at the end as well. But just to point out, too, that if you do have pets in the home, if you have uh, children, always a good idea to research uh, what you're bringing inside to make sure that it is safe for um, uh, poisonous or non-poisonous. Um, obviously something would have to bite into uh, a plant for that to be affected, but with pets, with children, you never know. So always a good idea to do your research and make sure to find out the toxicity of any kind of plant you're bringing inside. And most of them I've indicated as we go through here, but always good to, to check. Okay, so that's kind of a rundown of some of those houseplant 101 basics. Let's look at some plants, the kind of fun part here. So I've got some of our common houseplants grouped into categories here by light. So we're gonna start with the highlight houseplants. So if you remember back earlier, these are gonna be our Southern window uh, requirements. Okay, so we need quite a bit of light here. So several of you asked about succulents ahead of time. I love succulents, grow a ton of them. Uh, we love them because there's very minimal watering needed, at least that's why I uh, love them. And uh, for each of these, I'm gonna give a why I love them one. And say I've got nothing for these. I just love all everything about them. Uh, but if you are a chronic overwaterer, succulents are not gonna be your thing. And if you don't have enough light, succulents are not gonna be your thing. Okay, so I actually bring my succulents in during the winter and I keep them under grow lights and um, in a slightly heated uh, garage. Okay, so I actually just kind of let them go basically dormant for the winter uh, and then I take them back outside for the summer and I just let them do their their thing. Okay, so they're going to need that full sun, high light, water no more than probably once a week to 10 days during the really active growing season maybe once a month in the winter, if that, okay? So really watch the watering on the succulents. Okay, jade plants gonna be a succulent as well. This would be a specific kind of succulent that's very common, um, house plant. Love it, easy to grow, uh, lives for many years if you watch your watering and it'll form really cool kind of tree-like shapes, okay? So really watch that, that overwatering. Same conditions, bright light, uh, keep it moderately dry, do not overwater. And you can see there over time, you can get yourself a pretty good sized um, jade plant going. Okay. They do flower too, once they reach a, a mature enough age uh, to do so. And they do have pretty nice little star-shaped flowers too. Always good. This time of year, you might have a Norfolk Island pine hanging around in particular, because this is a common holiday uh, plant that you'll see um, put out. Uh, nice, cozy, soft texture, looks like a, a pine tree almost that you can bring inside. Uh, over time, you do tend to find the lower branches will start to die back, especially if you don't have enough high light available. Uh, and if you have low humidity, spider mites can be a, uh, a problem. So maybe not the, the easiest ones to manage, especially if you don't have the right conditions. But if you do, you have yourself a pretty good sized houseplant over time. 
Okay, and for me, get it without the glitter. You'll see it a lot of times for Christmas, they'll glitter it up and put ornaments and, and make it look like a, a Christmas tree. Okay. So bright light, typical temperatures, uh, allow the soil surface to dry between waterings and you should have a pretty happy Norfolk Island pine. Okay, so those are some of our highlight uh, ones, luckily. I don't have as many of those in here because to me, those are the most high maintenance. Most people are not gonna have that many Southern windows. So you're better off growing some of these tougher um, house plants that we're gonna get into, okay? So medium light house plants here. So our Eastern or Western windows are gonna be good for these. We've got the Boston Fern, of course, beautiful arching ferns you can put out on the front porch for the summer, bring them inside um, for the winter. Not one that I grow much of just because big in size and they tend to be rather messy. You lose a lot of fronds that will fall off there, but beautiful um, if you do grow them. So medium light, typical moisture. This is one, the most of the ferns are gonna tolerate uh, a kind of an even moisture. So this is one where you're not necessarily gonna let it dry completely down. In between, you're gonna keep it a little bit more on the evenly moist side. Tiger ferns are great that have that variegation built in there too. A little more interesting. Benjamin figs, a very common one. Um, if you need kind of a corner plant, a more of a tree shape, a larger house plant, you'll, you'll find Benjamin fig um, out there pretty common. Sometimes they will uh, twist the trunk that's growing and you'll have interesting forms there. Uh, one thing about Benjamin fig is that it doesn't like change. So if you have a happy spot for it, uh, leave her there. Uh, otherwise, you tend to get a lot of leaf drop, and I think I have a slide on that. So bright light, let it dry out between, keep it from cold drafts because that's also going to cause some of that leaf drop, but otherwise it's pretty good larger um, house plants. So there's what some of that leaf drop can look like. So if you move the location, if the light levels change, if there's a drafty area, um, you'll notice those leaves will yellow and then eventually um, drop off, in which is, is fine. There'll be more coming along, but it can just be kind of concerning when that happens. Okay. Uh, ivy is a great one, especially if you need a hanging basket uh, type of house plant. It's pretty vir uh, uh, versatile. I couldn't say that word. Um, it does, I find, tend to have pretty good spider mite problems, especially if you have low humidity. Um, so just kind of keep an eye out for, for that, um, is that they tend to be pretty common on there. But otherwise, it's a great climber, great trailing uh, houseplant, another one that you can keep pretty evenly uh, moist. Okay, but back to that toxicity list, this would be one of those that would be uh, poisonous if eaten. So we'd probably avoid that um, in those cases. Okay, fiddle leaf fig is kind of the, uh, I will say the millennials favorite house plant. I feel like it's, it's has a real movement right now. Everybody wants a fiddle leaf fig. Uh, I love it. Uh, Better homes and gardens. This is where this quote came from. It's one of the classiest looking indoor trees. So I'll go with it. It's a great, great house plant. Um, over time, uh, you will find that those lower leaves will drop, especially if you have low light. So over time, you're gonna end up with more of a tree form as time um, goes along. So medium to bright light. So this is one that I, I have it in the, uh, right in the window, um, getting as much light as possible. Uh, and that's gonna uh, do pretty well. Allow it to dry between waterings. And if you have it for a long time, it's fairly slow growing, but if you have it for a long time, you're gonna get a pretty good sized uh, tree. A wax plant I love. This is a Hoya uh, plant, another trailing um, plant that has beautiful flowers on it that have a great fragrance to them. If the conditions are right, you can have that. It is also very fleshy, succulent leaf. So this is going to be another one of those that will prefer to be a little bit dry. Um, if your lighting's too low, you may not have uh, blooms, but even the foliage I think is um, nice on that, even if you don't have blooms. Okay, so treat it similar to uh, some of our succulents, a little bit more on the drier side. Okay, peace lilies, very classic uh, house plant. Uh, 
love the the white flowers on uh, peace lily pretty sensitive to uh, water uh, issues though if you tend to get brown tips on it um, or minimal flowering the tips are probably from your water so you may want to switch to a filtered uh, distilled water if you're concerned about that uh, fluoride in your tap water can do that and if you're not having much flowering then you may not have enough uh, light uh, but overall though it's a pretty tough uh, plant this is one where um, it'll tell you if it needs water it'll basically lay flat all the plant the leaves will essentially droop all the way over and if you water it they will perk right back up it is a tough um, a tough one okay keep it pretty evenly moist. Okay. Red dracaenas, and in particular the red edge dracaenas, another common uh, group of uh, plants there. Uh, again, you might have some tip burn on this one if you have uh, too much light or if the soil is too dry. You might have some tip burn. Tricolor is a, a cultivar that has even more kind of color variation in there. Um, but otherwise, same medium light conditions allow the soil to dry between another poisonous uh, option there. And typically when you you get this, you'll find several of them potted together, usually so you kind of have this grouping of um, red dracaena and the stems will just get longer and longer over time. So you get a bigger and bigger kind of tree form over the years. Okay. Schefflera's or uh, dwarf umbrella plant is a very common popular uh, house plant for medium light. Great large glossy leaves kind of gives that tropical um, feel. Very similar growing conditions, medium lights, similar temperatures. Uh, this one will tolerate a little bit more of that moist um, soil over time. And this is one again, where if you let it go, you're gonna get a pretty good sized uh, tree form over time. Okay, pretty easy. Same thing with rubber tree. This one can get to a really good size if you uh, let it get big, big, shiny, uh, dark green uh, leaves. Make this a nice uh, ficus option. Same growing conditions, allow it to dry between. Um, this does have a milky sap um, to it. So if you did happen to break a stem off or break a leaf off and you got it on your skin, it might cause irritation for some folks if you have sensitive skin. So just be aware of that um, milky sap. Spider plants is another great one if you're a beginner um, house plant grower. It is pretty tough and it's e very easy to propagate if you need more uh, plants. Also really sensitive to um, water issues too. So this is another one where if you want those pristine leaf edges and you don't want browning, you're gonna need to switch to, to um, filter distilled water. Okay, any fluoride, anything in the water is typically what's gonna cause that um, tip browning. Okay, but it will of course put off all of these daughter plants that will hang down. So this is a great one in a hanging basket and you can cut off those and propagate them and share with friends and have a bunch of spider plants, okay? Otherwise, very easy to grow. Okay, okay so those are our medium light ones. Now we've gotten to the really tough guys, okay? So these are the ones that you could put it in an office building with hardly any windows. I have one of these in a bathroom with zero windows and it does good. So if you're new, uh, you're not sure what to start with, these I would be the ones that I would recommend uh, to start with because they're very adaptable. You can put them in a lot of different areas of the home and have pretty good success, okay? So a couple of these examples. Uh, Chinese evergreen, the aglionemas are really tough foliage plants, really cool patterns on the leaves, okay? Not much reason not to like them, I think. Uh, keep it evenly moist on this one. But you'll notice a lot of them in this group and category uh, tend to have oxalates and various other things that make them poison if eaten. So again, do your research, make sure what you're selecting is gonna be safe uh, to what is inside your, your home. Diffenbachias, dumb canes is the next one. Again, big leaves with different um, foliage patterns that are very, um, you have your lime greens, different speckled patterns. Again, another one that is uh, poisonous is ingested, 
okay? Keep evenly moist. And this one, again, over time can get to a pretty good sized uh, plant if you let it. And as you can see, what'll happen usually is the bottom leaves will start to, to die back and you'll get a more of a tree form over time. Okay, philodendron and our next one, pothos, are probably on the top of my list for ones that, to start with if you're new. Uh, this is the one that I have in the bathroom with zero windows and it still does good. Um, it is a trailing uh, plant, so it's great in a basket or hanging over uh, a shelf, something like that. It will take very low light, uh, allow it to dry in between uh, waterings. Um, and again, poisonous if, uh, if chewed on but otherwise very tough, uh, low light houseplant. And philodendron you're gonna find typically has a little bit more of a heart shaped and a tapered uh, tip on the leaf. When you compare it to our next one, which is pothos or devil's ivy, they look very similar. So until you kind of know the difference between the two, you probably get used. Um, both of them very tough good low light options for both of these. Okay, so this one's your pothos. I love the neon that has that bright green um, color uh, to it. And sometimes you'll find them too in the garden center, they'll train them kind of up a pole in the pot. So you can certainly have it climb um, things or you can have it trail over the edge, either one of those, okay. Super tough, love it. This one, you could probably drop a bomb on this houseplant and it would still grow well. Okay, this is another one that is almost a no fail. Um, if you need somewhere to start, snake plants are awesome. Okay, they are very slow growing. So you're not gonna get a pot that's gonna fill out very quickly over time, uh, but it's gonna be very tough and almost indestructible. Uh, it unless well if you overwatered it that would probably be the only way to really <laughs> to really uh, kill this guy off otherwise let it dry between waterings and you're going to have a pretty tough house plant okay uh, you can also get the bird's nest form that has more of a lower uh, rosette type of, of growth too those are also fun okay another one of my favorites is zz plant i love zz plant also really tough like snake, snake plant and also really slow growing okay so this one you might find to be rather expensive at the garden center because it takes quite a bit of time in the greenhouse to get a good sized plant going so the the cost is really just because of the time it takes to um, get a good sized plant but if you have one, you'll uh, love it. I have one behind me on my coffee table. It's about 10 feet from a northern facing window. So it is not getting a whole lot of light uh, coming from that window and it does great, okay? So definitely try ZZ if you haven't uh, tried that one. Okay, finishing it off with, again, this is my personal uh, opinion of ones that I've, uh, either killed many times over, over the years or have just found it not to be worth um, time when I can do something that's a lot easier. Uh, crotons, I love crotons. They're beautiful color patterns, reds, oranges, yellows. As a house plant though, the spider mites love them. Okay, so not my favorite. You can do it. Any of these you can do for sure, but just a couple of tips of ones that I maybe worth the, the time. Grape ivy, I find, has to have a lot of powdery mildew issues. Elephant ears, if you try to bring those in, especially from outside, and you try to keep it as a house plant, can be tough, okay, because they are tro very tropical. They really need that humidity. Almost impossible because it requires very cool, moist conditions. Same with banana plants. Great outside for the summer, but inside in a typical house condition, the humidity is just tough. So if you're up for a challenge, uh, there's definitely a lot of stuff you can try. But for me, I'm all for an interesting uh, house plant, but I also am realistic with myself that even though I'm a horticulturist, I am tough on my plants. If it cannot survive neglect, then it is not meant for me as a house plant, okay? So that's me. Um, I do love a good challenge though every once in a while too. So uh, also uh, 
not a huge fan of things that are painted. That's always a trend nowadays is you'll find succulents that are spray painted different colors or uh, these are all spray painted poinsettias. This is another one of those where you kind of treat it as a cut flower. You enjoy it for what it is, uh, but the reality is that uh, you may be covering those uh, leaves that need to photosynthesize with uh, paint. So um, that's always just kind of a pet peeve of mine is let them be natural. Let us enjoy those, <laughs> those house plants. So just to give you a, a, a boost of encouragement, uh, I myself have killed many a house plant. So if you have done the same, don't feel bad about it. It's all an experiment. It's all in fun. You learn something new with every um, house plant you get. And that, for me, that's kind of the, the most fun part is learning new things about each, um, each plant. Okay. So before we get to questions, um, a couple of resources here. We do have a website, uh, an extension website devoted to house plants. So you can head there and find some great information. Um, ASPCA also has a great uh, animal poison, uh, poisonous plants list if you need to do some more research there. And there, excuse me, are tons of houseplant books. Just go to Amazon or whatever store and do a search for houseplant books and you'll find a ton of them. Uh, a couple of fun ones I have on the shelf are um, indestructible houseplant. Along these similar lines, it's going to talk about the toughest um, houseplants uh, that are going to be the most indestructible. And same thing with how not to kill your houseplant. That's a great one for beginners too. But there are many more books you can have on the shelf as well. Okay, and before we get to um, questions, I also want to make sure to mention that uh, the Champaign County Master Gardeners are uh, putting this on today and sponsoring this, and they do have an Ask a Master Gardener help desk. So if you have questions about houseplants or any gardening topic, um, you can head to their webpage, click the Ask a Master Gardener button, and they will answer those questions for you. So that's a awesome resource 